Hello, everyone. I'm Sewell Chan, the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune. Thank you for tuning in to our conversation of on the, about the influx of Californians in Texas and their impact on the state's economy, population, and politics. I'm joined today by five distinguished uh, uh, commentators and experts who will uh, engage with me in this discussion. They're Kenneth Miller, Alexandra Sush Bass, Ben Rowan, Jennifer Murchia, and Sergio Garcia Rios. Miller is the Rose Professor of State and Local Government and Director of the Rose Institute at Claremont McKenna College. He is the author of the wonderful book, Texas vs. California, A History of Their Struggle for the Future of America, released in 2020. Such Bass is the Economist's Senior Correspondent for Politics, Technology, and Society, covering a range of political and public policy topics. She is the author of a special report that ran in 2019, arguing that America's future can be understood by studying California and Texas. Rowan is an associate news and politics editor at Texas Monthly. He recently published a story that encouraged Texans to embrace California transplants called The Case for More Californians. Before joining Texas Monthly, Rowan worked as an editor and fact checker at Pacific Standard and The Atlantic. Murchia is a professor of communication at Texas A&M University, where she writes about American political discourse, especially as it relates to citizenship, democracy, and the presidency. She is the author of Demagogue for President, The Rhetorical Genius of Donald Trump, published in 2020. Last but not least, Garcia Rios is an assistant professor of government and Latino studies at Cornell University. His research focuses on voter turnout, political participation, and public opinion especially among Latino immigrants. Let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, the purpose of this discussion is, is to talk about the, implant, the influx of, of, of Californians in Texas, but it's also to get at some, some, some bigger issues involving you know, two, America's two largest states, which together represent one in five Americans and uh, about a quarter of America's GDP, and, and in many ways, of course, present parallel and some would argue competing visions um, for governance in America. Um, why don't we start out just, just with the phenomenon itself. Ben, would you talk us a little bit through the reasons Californians are moving to Texas and, and you know, how you interpret the phenomenon, particularly as someone who, like me, has lived in California as well? Yes, yeah, so it obviously is a little self-serving for me to make the case for Californians being from California myself. Um, but I think that the phenomena is best explained by sort of three pull factors. You've got what's drawing businesses and you've got what's drawing individuals. And as far as businesses, um, Texas has a relatively lax or regulatory environment and business leaders are more involved in um, political discussions maybe. You think in 2020, Elon Musk, who is feuding with the California government over COVID restrictions, and he comes here and is welcomed by Governor Greg Abbott and told that he'll fit right in. Um, and then I think the third poll factor is a um, just much, much lower cost of living relative to California and Texas. Obviously, that's changing as more people move here. Um, but I think as it's framed as a political issue, uh, it's it's perceived as a influx of sort of left communists that might not actually be who's coming here. Great, great. That's very helpful, um, Alexandra. You taught it's it, Alexandra for the first after this twenty twenty census for the very first time in its history. California lost one congressional seat. Texas, of course, uh, gained two. Uh, and, um, you know, Texas's population continues to grow at a rapid clip. By many measures, California kind of has stopped growing in population and is kind of stable of where it is at about 40 million people. Texas is just about to hit 30 million and continues to grow. Um, Alexandra, what are some of the forces that, that you think have led to this kind of con continued dynamism in Texas, even at, as California has kind of reached this mature state? So, you so say your question is why does Texas continue to grow and attract people to the extent that it yeah. it has? You know, I think there's Ben mentioned the pro business environment, and that's been going on for years, and I think is really distinct from California's approach. When I was writing my special report, I interviewed Governor Gavin Newsom, and one of the 
things that he told me was he feels like California rested on its laurels a bit. They, you know, people kicked up their feet and would talk about the good old days. And I think there was a sense among California's government that businesses would want to stay there because California had so much to offer. I think that COVID has changed that a lot. Um, and people are much, and companies are much more willing, much more willing to rethink where they want to be. Texas's government, in contrast to California's, has operated a little bit like a business itself with kind of going with uh, Governor Perry famously went on hunting trips to California to recruit businesses. So I think that mentality of being pro-business um, and strategic about growth has been in place for more than a decade in Texas um, and is still very much there. I think you can argue about whether or not the politics will ultimately alienate some Californians um, and discourage some people from thinking about making the the move. But um, I think that really Texas's approach um, and its framework of being low tax pro-business um, and kind of always towing to that line and not necessarily introducing um, other things is, is, is what's allowed it to continue to grow. And you see that, I mean, I think it's epitomized in the Dallas, Fort Worth area where you're just seeing a tremendous growth, although it, that area is not alone. You see it throughout Texas and especially in the Texas Triangle. It's very, very helpful. Ken, your book takes a really deep dive into the history of both states, and you find some real paradoxes. You know, both Texas and, and California were part of originally the Spanish Empire and then part of Mexico. They both entered the Union uh, in similar years, 1845 for Texas, 1850 for California. Uh, for much of the 20th century, California was a Republican state, uh, electing such Republican leaders as Earl Warren and Ronald Reagan while uh, Texas was an almost uniformly democratic state and elected, of course, you know, one of America's most liberal presidents, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson. How, in your view, uh, did the kind of current uh, uh, makeup of the two states, you know, and their divergence, you know, from each other, you know, you, you begin? You describe California and Texas as siblings, and, uh, but, but kind of mirror images of each other. Could you elaborate on that idea? Sure. Um, <clears throat> one of the fun things about comparing California and Texas is everybody thinks of them as these polar opposites and rivals, but in many ways they have deep similarities going back to their origins as being part of uh, Spain and Mexico and coming into the United States um, almost simultaneously in the mid 19th century, being high growth states, developing powerful economies, being diverse. Uh, both states are among only six U.S. states that are majority minority population, um, and they both have almost identical percentage Hispanic population, uh, 39% or so. So you see um, amazing similarities, and it goes beyond that, actually. And, and this goes to, in part, why it's, uh, I, I think there's so much movement from uh, California to Texas is because uh, they feel in many ways similar. The built environment of Dallas feels much more like L.A., than New York City does, for example. It's, uh, it's very easy in many ways to transition from Southern California to the DFW um, area or other parts of Texas, just because it feels similar as a car culture and all of that. So um, the similarities run deep, and yet they are absolutely polar opposites politically and on a partisan basis. And so what I did in the book was try to unpack the reasons for that. And what I found is going all the way back to the origins, California oriented as a northern state, uh, Texas, with the south, and that had deep, um, long-standing uh, consequences for the two states. That uh, Texas is just has always been a more uh, politically uh, and culturally conservative state than California, California more progressive. And what happened ultimately is the United States divided and sorted out ideologically in its party system, with progressives gravitating toward the Democratic Party and conservatives uh, to the Republican Party. And so these two states have naturally gravitated in those directions. And that's why you see the political rivalry between the two states. Sergio, tell us a little bit about the about um, 
voting behavior among Latinos and also pe immigrants and people of color more generally, perhaps, in California and Texas. A lot of people tend, to, I, I think some people tend to think of the migration of Californians to Texans and vice versa as being one predominantly involving Anglo people, but that's obviously not the case. It's definitely not the case, and I think um, Ben puts it uh, very nicely. There are several factors, and one of those definitely is uh, cost of living. We, um, we conducted a survey recently with Univision, and we found that the topics or issues that um, Latinos focus on, uh, comparing Texas and California, were largely the same, with the exception of cost of living, which um, was uh, a priority for Latinos in California. Other than that, they look very similarly. Uh, there's a tendency to think of uh, Latinos and minority groups in general as a monolith, and also as ones that usually vote democratic. That's not always the case. And now we've been paying a lot of attention to what happened in Southern Texas and uh, areas around the border. And um, I think those tendencies have been there for a while. Uh, they really haven't, uh, it's, we don't see anything really new. We pay more attention now and we were expecting certain behavior given uh, Trump's uh, presidency, but uh, those have been there for a while. And the same thing happens in California. Not all Latinos in California are uh, Democrats, and certainly not all Latinos in uh, t Texas are Democrats. Uh, we, there's a tendency to think of them as uh, a monolith. That's, that's not the case. And However, we can think of uh, these similarities that Ken mentions. There's uh, many of them, and I, I agree that when you see the numbers, you will find that uh, Democrats, uh, Latinos in Texas are very similar to Latinos in California for the most part. Um, tell me, but what about voting behavior and also turnout? Um, you know, California has achieved some milestones with, you know, having the first U.S. senator, uh, of the first Latino U.S. senator from California, uh, Alex Padilla. Uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, the HHS secretary now uh, comes from, comes from uh, California. Um, you know, on the Texas side, you've got, you know, Latino candidates like George P. Bush, you know, scion of the Bush dynasty, who's now running for attorney general. Um, you know, is it true that Latino voters in Texas have traditionally turned out, like all voters in Texas, in kind of lower numbers? And what do you attribute that to? It's true, and it's, uh, for the most part, mobilization. Uh, there's a big question about uh, being asked to vote, and, and the mobilization has been lacking. And we've seen efforts to change that, and they have worked. And we, we saw in, uh, in Beto or are mobilizing a lot of Latino, especially young Latino voters. So that also, uh, to uh, center on your question, uh, should we expect uh, some of these gains for uh, Latino leadership to continue? It's not clear. It depends really uh, who mobilizes Latinos. Mobilization is a key component. And uh, let's remember the preferred candidate for Latinos during the presidential election was actually Bernie Sanders. And again, uh, once uh, we saw Beto versus the Cruz, it was Beto who was the preferred uh, candidate for uh, Latinos. So it's, it really comes down to mobilization, but I'll say more importantly, issues. I think Latinos, just like any other voter, really pay attention to the issues that they care about and who's pay, who, which candidate is paying attention to those issues. Why do you think Trump was able to move some of those South Texas counties so much further in the Republican camp? And, and we go back to the same. It, it's some Latinos, and we... Uh, sort of have to move away from thinking of Latinos as one monolith that yep. immigration will be the one issue mobilizing them. And many saw in Trump a, an answer to economic worries, a job, and then with the pandemic in the middle, we heard many Latinos uh, saying that they thought Trump will get them back to work and they knew yep. the risk, but they needed to put food on the table. And if yep. that meant voting for Trump, that was definitely the answer. Yeah, very, very helpful. Jennifer, you uh, not off, You often see in Texas the bumper sticker, don't California, my Texas. And uh, I think that says so much in that, in that sentiment. Could you help us understand uh, the role that the two states play in kind of political discourse, and in particular how that discourse in Texas is changing with all these California influences uh, uh, moving in? Yeah, I mean, I think... The main difference between um, the political discourse about California and about Texas, right, is that um, Texas 
has Texas exceptionalism, right? Which is this idea that Texas is the greatest place in the world, <laughs> uh, right? It's the chosen place. It's uh, definitely the language that Texas politicians use, whether they're Democratic or Republican. I mean, if you think about Beto's um, campaign for Senate against Ted Cruz, I mean, he was all about, you know, being authentically Texas in a certain way. Um, and, and that is an argument that I think plays well here in a way that doesn't sort of work anywhere else in the United States. I mean, you don't have people in Michigan or, you know, Minnesota saying we're the best, you know, Minnesota is the greatest state in the whole, you know, United States. Whereas um, in Texas, you can't run for office unless you do that. Um, and so I think that that is fascinating. Uh, California doesn't do that in the same way. Um, California is way more, you know, sort of laid back and chill about its awesomeness um, <laughs> compared to Texas. And, um, you know, it's, it's almost like a defining characteristic. Um, and so I think you see that play out in political messages of all kinds, whether it's pride of place, whether it's pride of, you know, the economic and political system, um, you know, or about values. In all of those things, um, there's a kind of Texas swagger that you don't see in other places. You so know, can I? Go ahead. I was just going to add that, you know, when you saw these ads about don't California, my Texas, in some ways it used to be a red herring. Like Californians weren't necessarily coming in huge numbers. It was about 80,000 people in 2019. So for a, a state of 29 million people, it, it, it wasn't enormous. It, what's interesting is that what started as fear mongering actually now is happening much more in earnest. I think more than ever before is the risk of California coming as a partly as a result of COVID and California's tax policy. So I just think it's worth noting that while this conversation has been happening for seven plus years, um, it about the the worry of California it's coming, it's it's finally actually happening. And it's, do we have the numbers in, in for 2020 and 2021? I mean, uh, you know, there's, it's so recent that it can get be hard to get an accurate count. I mean, the, U-Haul, U-Haul certainly says that the number one one-way rentals um, are from California to Texas uh, throughout the country. The most reliable data is IRS data, and we don't have um, data through the pandemic, unfortunately. That's what allows us to understand yeah. um, who's coming from where and at what income bracket. So that's going to be the most interesting thing to yeah. watch. Ben. Yeah, I just want to add that there's a pretty clear distinction, however, between the rhetoric of Don't California, My Texas, or even George Bush, who issued a similar message in his 1990s campaigns for governor, um, and the actual policies that these politicians are, you know, leaving in place. I think um, Greg Abbott had a campaign slogan, Don't California, My Texas. Meanwhile, is you know encouraging California businesses to move here through the Enterprise Fund, um, and on top of that, uh, when Californian businessmen move here, telling them that they fit right in. Um, I think a direct quote from his tweet about um, Elon Musk coming coming in. So can we can we walk through that paradox for a moment? Because as these businesses come, you know, a lot as we saw with the transgender bathroom bill a few years back. And as we may be seeing now with the uh, issues surrounding abortion and reproductive rights, it, it, is there some potential for clashes between these new economy companies, tech, et cetera, which often have a more social libertarian ethos? You know, they want the tax breaks or the sub or the incentives to come here, and they definitely want you know access to Texas talent and the talented workforce here. But but might they be forces that start to push back on? Uh, um, some of the more um, uh, right-wing policies in the state. Yeah, I'll jump in on that. It, it seems to me that that's the point where there might be real tension moving forward is between uh, the major corporate players who come from a different sector than the more uh, traditional, more conservative uh, corporate sector in Texas, oil and gas, insurance, those types of things. When you start introducing Apple and Google and uh, Amazon and these kinds of uh, companies into uh, a more conservative uh, uh, social environment, then you're going to see a clash because Tim Cook, you know, personally cares a lot about some of these social issues um, and other corporate CEOs and uh, employees, and they try to leverage it. Uh, their, their presence in Texas uh, 
and the economic benefits they bring to the state to try to affect uh, Texas social policy. And so I think that's going to be a, a, a conflict moving forward. I guess my question would be, um, if we look at recent political history in Texas, um, say just had some of the most right-wing legislative sessions in its history this past year. Um, a number of businesses rallied against the SB1, the elections bill, which ended up passing. Um, you know, there was the heartbeat bill, which passed. And I'm wondering where that tension is playing out currently. Um, and on top of that, uh, wondering, I mean, I, I know a lot of right-wing candidates for statewide office have talked about this issue and wanting to end the enterprise fund attracting businesses, but I'm wondering where do you see that those tension points right now? One thing I would like to add is that it's worth paying attention to where the issues have been moving to. I think there's been uh, the polarization is high. Uh, legislation doesn't always match uh, public opinion. And we've been seeing that now for uh, several years now, even the, the abortion law was not hugely uh, supported by public opinion, still it went um, past. And so it will be interesting to see whether these demographic changes are the ones that are causing some of these clashes or whether, you know, the disconnect between public opinion and legislation is already pushing some of those clashes anyways. Well, it does seem to be a, a factional division within the dominant political party in the, in the Republican Party that the social conservatives against the business interests. Um, and you see that playing out in the legislature. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, the business community, um, including uh, these out-of-state corporations coming in, into Texas, will ultimately probably have a moderating influence on social policy in, in Texas. But uh, the more sort of activist conservative right has a big you know, uh, power base within the, the Republican Party. And so it's, um, to me, that's, when you, when you think about Texas politics, it's really not so much in the in the short run about Republican versus Democrat, but it's internally within the Republican Party, which faction is going to become um, ascendant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, I want to bring you in here. Um, I'm curious about the each state as the locus as a, as, or as, the, as a state of resistance in a hyperpolarized time. When Obama was president, you know, Greg Abbott, who was then attorney general, famously said something along the lines of, I wake up, I go to the office and sue President Obama, then I go home. Now, of course, during Trump's presidency, it was California. And, and its attorney general that was, you know, leading kind of the blue states in challenging many of Trump's proposed uh, regulatory actions, including around environment and certainly immigration. Uh, now, of course, the shoe is on the other foot again, and it's uh, again, Texas is filing all this litigation during the Biden era. You know, what, what, what do you kind of make of this phenomenon and how do you think that this is playing out kind of in the national imagination? Yeah, um, you know, the, the national imagination, I think you're right, of California and Texas is that they are, you know, the linchpins of either, you know, the blue resistance or the red resistance, um, depending on where we are. Um, and, and they take on those roles, as you've noted. I mean, they really do embrace it as the sort of like, this is, we are, you know, this blue, where we are this red, um, and it's our duty to respond um, and really sort of taking advantage of that, you know, idea of the um, each state having a, a Republican form of government, right? So that it can be used to resist the federal government when they see the federal government is doing wrong. Um, you know, I mean, the way that we're so polarized at this moment, you almost would expect it, right? That it's, it's almost necessary that there would be a kind of state level leadership, um, and with Texas and California being the two biggest states, most electoral college votes, um, and then themselves being at least at the level of elected officials, the most polarized, um, you know, obviously there are Republicans in California and there are Democrats in Texas, um, you know, and so the, the imagination is that it's deep, deep blue and deep, deep red. And so they sort of act accordingly. 
Yeah, no, but you, you also do well to point out the tremendous variety within the states. You know, when I was at the Los Angeles Times after the election, we, I, de I decided to devote a full page of letters to the editor from Californians who had voted for Donald Trump after the election was decided. And I got a lot of heat from liberals, you know, outraged that 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 side was given a voice. But of course, you know, I mean, Trump was crushed in California, but he still won 38, 39 percent. And of course, many of the divisions now within America and certainly within both of these states are rural versus urban, religious versus secular, unmarried versus me. I mean, it's so many different dimensions. So so sometimes yeah. thinking about it just as states is, of course, you know, of limited helpfulness. I went to high school and college in California. That's where my family is still. And where my family lives in the Central Valley um, is conservative. So everyone I know in California votes for Donald Trump. Um, and I live in Texas now, and I have for a long time. And everyone I know here voted for Joe Biden. So, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. it isn't yeah. what it's made out to be in the national yeah. imagination. Just, yeah. just a quick fact on that. More, more people voted for Trump in California than in any other state. And yep. that's more than in Texas. Actually, so, <laughs> now uh, was now was Texas Biden's second uh, highest vote count in terms of just raw totals. I think well, that's right. Okay. That's a, that's, yeah. I, that'd be an interesting thing yeah. to uh, factor in as well. Yeah, because yeah. Biden actually came close. So, so there are some differences, right? I mean, Texas has you know the, the complete control of government in Texas under Republicans has been in case in in since 2003, when there was like kind of a, a trifecta, right, Ken? Yes. And in California, that only goes back to 2011, when uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger left office. Where do you think the two states are, um, Ken, in terms of potentially seeing the, the smaller party, you know, in, in terms of becoming truly competitive? Do you think that's more likely to happen in Texas first than in California or vice versa? No, absolutely. I mean, the Democratic Party has a, a large foothold in Texas at the um, at the city level. I mean, the Democrats control all the major cities in Texas, and they have a substantial, um, you know, uh, stake in the legislature as well. It's true that there's a, a, a complete unified Republican control of state government, but the races are closer in Texas uh, than they are in California. In California, the Republican Party is is extremely weak, uh, and the, the percentages uh, uh, for the losing candidate in statewide elections are low. Uh, so I would say that there's a much greater chance of real two-party competition in Texas than in California. Uh, and you feel that way, even notwithstanding the recent redistricting, changes in voting rules uh, and eligibility, et cetera? Uh, absolutely. I, it, the underlying the sort of fundamentals of uh, political ideology and orientation and structure and everything in California uh, is just different than Texas. The, the obstacles to, for the minority party in, in California are greater than in Texas. There's a real opportunity for, for Texas Democrats if they can occupy sort of a, a middle position um, in, in ideologically uh, to do very well statewide. And, and if they can produce strong candidates. The, the problem that Texas Democrats have is that they're tied to the National Democratic Party. And so it's easy for Republicans to sort of uh, put up a, an ad with whoever's running for office as a Democrat in Texas next to Nancy Pelosi or Bernie Sanders or whomever. And uh, the National Democratic Party is too far left for Texas. Um, that's in the same way that the National Republican Party is too far right for California. So can I add one one thing to that. I think there's also an interesting question about whether the boost that we've seen to Republican states in the wake of COVID-19 um, is temporary or permanent. A lot of people are responding to the restrictive policies in blue states, moving to red states like Texas and Florida. Um, the assumption is that they might actually buck the Democratic Party because that's where they came from and they want you know, the Republican vision of the future. That might be true while COVID is the main issue, but I think when you pan out longer term in both Texas and Florida, there's a case to be made that the demographic shifts are such that actually we're going to see much more of a movement toward Democrats. So I think the time in which we're having this conversation is a really interesting one to look yeah. forward at politics, because if we look at only current policies, while COVID is so much on people's minds and the associated restrictions, I think it looks like a different picture than if we pan out and look longer term. 
Let, let's stay with the coronavirus for a moment. I, I think I saw a recent Pew Research um, Center report that found that um, Republicans tend to overestimate the risks of the vaccines, which of course are negligible according to public health experts, whereas Democrats tend to overrate their risk of getting the virus, which doesn't mean the virus isn't super serious, but it does mean that, for example, if you've been triple vaxxed and boosted, as, as many Californians are, you know, the risk of getting seriously ill does become quite low. And so I wonder, you know, have we seen in, in, this, in this tremendous tragedy over the last two years, you know, I, you know or, or, do any of you feel kind of surprised that, that it had such a polarizing effect and such different outcomes in different states? Or was this kind of always going to be the consequence of a hyperpolarized America? It is surprising, um, especially if you look at research about um, how innate differences between conservatives and liberals um, in terms of their threat responses and fear responses. Um, you know, you could have predicted before the virus um, emerged that conservatives would be the ones that would be much more worried about, you know, the the illness, the sickness, the the threat itself, um, and the way that the Trump administration politicized it um, and turned it into, you know, sort of a, an issue of American exceptionalism, you know, as opposed to Texas exceptionalism, and you know, sort of toughness and um, and that kind of thing. Um, really, I think, uh, flipped what you might have expected would have been the natural innate responses of conservatives and liberals. Um, kind of another question along these lines. Um, my sense, um, I should, and I should make sure that's backed up by, by, by data, but Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris may be less popular in California than Donald Trump is in Texas. Can any of you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my understanding generally is that the most motivating issue for voters in Texas right now, um, and certainly for Republican voters in Texas, is the border. And I think that there is a perception that Kamala Harris has, you know, was, was appointed by its border, border czar, has been, um, you know, uh, not handling that appropriately. I'm not quite as sure with the other side of that question why we'd expect Donald Trump to be super unpopular in Texas. I mean, I think Kamala Harris's poll numbers are in part tied to the administration generally, and Biden's poll numbers are low. Uh, so she's going to be dragged down by that in part as well. It's kind of easier to be the out party in a way. That's, that's one reason why Democrats are very concerned about this midterm election is that uh, it's easy for people with discontent uh, to vote against the uh, the party in power. And so uh, that's partly how I would explain it, that uh, Trump as an outsider now um, is easy for uh, people to sort of rally support around him, uh, whereas uh, Harris is part of a, at this point, relatively uh, unpopular administration. Well, so another topic I wanted to address was... Um Kind of the relative fortunes of each state. Um, let's go around. Which state are you kind of more optimistic about um, for for kind of its long term trajectory, and, and why? Can we do a quick round robin? I'm going to start with Ben. <laughs> Putting me in the unenviable spot. Um, I think that they're going to answer with uh, first a non answer. I promise a, a a quick answer at the end. But I think that a lot of the challenges that California faces deal with that booming population, which is slowing a little bit and um, are challenges that are coming to Texas now. So yeah. you think about exploding rents, um, exploding cost of living, not enough housing, homelessness. Um, I think Texas is about to face a lot of those struggles and already is facing a lot of those struggles that California did not address um, and, and did not address well, at least. Um, as far as which states prospects uh, I'm more positive on, I think that uh, Texas is going to have a bigger population in 50 years than California. I think it's sort of, at least for now, winning that battle, which is more appealing for people to live in. 
Um, I think that there are sort of infrastructure challenges here that might not exist in California, however. Um, and then the unknown factor of climate change, of course. Right. Yeah. Um, Sergio? I'm um, excited about Texas. I don't know if uh, optimistic, but definitely excited about Texas. Um, I, I think this is, Texas is going to be the most important state uh, uh, in terms of electoral politics, and definitely uh, presidential elections. Uh, it's going to be a key state, and I think it's uh, definitely getting closer and closer to being a battleground. If not, it is now at this point. There's, of course, a concern about the, you know, all the electoral laws and redistricting, gerrymandering. I'll say to this, and we're talking about how important those might be, but research has found so far that while minorities are disproportionately affected, uh, when it comes to turnout, uh, we haven't seen a lot of changes. In fact, we have seen increases in the states. And this might be because of mobilization. So I know that what we are about to see is massive mobilization for Latinos and other minorities in Texas. It would be nice if that happened nationwide and if it happened also in California. But, you know, the minorities vote sometimes is taken for granted. I don't think that's going to be the case in Texas, and that's always good. Sergio, do you think the mobilization of voters will take lines similar to those of Arizona and Georgia? I mean, remember. To. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, walk, yeah, walk us through why. He has to. If, if they want, one of the biggest challenges for Latinos is it starts even with registration. Yeah. Uh, many uh, potential voters haven't even registered. And it, it starts from there. Uh, I think mobilization usually focuses on those who are already excited to vote anyways. And uh, that was not the case in Arizona. They focus on those who usually don't vote, usually those who usually uh, tend to stay at the margins uh, and, and focusing on young voters. I think uh, the, it's very clear that either Democrats or Republicans, if they want the Latino vote, they have to focus uh, on young voters. And I, I see that happening. Thank you. Jennifer? Well, you know, one thing that we haven't actually talked about is tourism. Um, in thinking about the relationship, you know, between Texas and California and the United States, and then also in the world, um, you know, when people think of the United States, they think of California, and that's where they want to go. Um, you know, if, if we're drawing, you know, tourists from anywhere, um, it's, it's going to be more California than it is Texas. Um, and so I guess I think about that when I think about, you know, of course, there's the business and the infrastructure challenges um, of, of folks moving to Texas, but there's also the way that, you know, Texas isn't just a draw for people naturally to want to come here. Um, you know, there has to be the incentive of cheaper homes or, you know, good jobs or whatever. Um, whereas California does have that, right. You know, um, it doesn't matter where you are in the state, you're, you're an hour or two away from somewhere pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and that isn't necessarily the case in Texas. Uh, so I would just say that. I mean, I think that the, the future of both states is, is obviously going to be very strong, but that um, Texas does um, lack some of the tourist appeal that maybe California has. Yeah, Jennifer, that's super interesting. And, you know, California probably has more of a global reputation if you're asking yeah. people about visiting the U.S. for the first time. Although Texas, I think, within the within America has a stronger kind of um, narrative of itself, right? Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Ken? Yeah, so I, I would say uh, California should be dominant in this competition, given its natural advantages and the investments over the past century and more, um, has so many natural advantages over Texas. Uh, but it seems to have, in many ways, reached a plateau. Uh, and just not in terms of just population, but I think in terms of dynamism and, and such. The, the big exception to that, of course, is the tech sector in Silicon Valley. And it'll be very interesting to see how long that run plays. Uh, that's, that's really kept the state um, flourishing in many ways. But in, in many other respects, California has plateaued, and it's looking in many ways much like New York State. So New York uh, peaked sort of in the mid-20th century, and it's been um, you know, a very important state. Uh, it's wealthy, high per capita GDP, all those things, but its population has been flat for a half century. And uh, California is sort of moving into that trajectory of being a state that uh, has been dominant and is now sort of flattening out. Texas has this opportunity uh, 
to it has a much higher ceiling. There's room to grow, and it's will be very interesting, and I think important for the nation actually to see uh, uh, Texas develop in a in a positive uh, positive way. Alexandra. It's ding- so your question is dangerous territory. I feel like whenever I make predictions on California that are even slightly negative, I get hate mail. But um, I would say that unquestionably, this will be Texas's decade. I think that there are things that are in California's leaders control and Texan leaders control that will um, affect the, the, the coming years in the states. I mean, California is so reliant on its top income earners, tourism matters, but, um, you know, the tech sector and a well-paid executive staying in California matters hugely to the future of the state, at least fiscally. 1% of top earners pay almost 50% of personal income tax. So to the extent that California makes itself an unappealing place uh, for entrepreneurs and other people to continue wanting to live, that will affect the whole California model, which hinges on high taxes, high regulation, um, but better services. And I think COVID has exposed a lot of the weaknesses of the California model because people realize they're not necessarily getting great services if schools can't open for much of the year for in-person learning, for example. And that's why we've seen people opt to uh, leave for Texas to So to the extent that California's leaders don't grapple with some of the reasons why people are choosing to leave, I think it will hugely disadvantage California. I would say the same with Texas. I mean, to the extent that politicians don't focus on the issues that really matter to people and will change the Texas model, which is, you know, low tax, low services, but, you know, it, it's potentially easier to pull yourself up by your bootstraps in Texas to the extent that they don't grapple with public transportation, infrastructure, affordability. I think that Texas will become a less appealing magnet. It will absolutely be a magnet in the next 10 years, but that's a longer term answer. So I think the fate of both states will do will depend on the strategy of the leaders, but things I think are a little bit easier for Texas in the next decade than California. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, Alexandra, your, you know, your special report really goes into such depth across all these different areas. And, you know, it is, it is worth, I think, reminding, you know, us and our audience that, you know, Texas does have a lot of structural challenges. You know, the poverty rate is higher. The, the safety net is thinner. Um, the, some of the, the school outcomes, unfortunately, in both states are not, are not, are not great. Um, but you know, the infrastructure in Texas is also becoming, I think, an increasing concern, right? After last year's winter storms. So there are a lot of questions, I guess, about Texas's long-term sustainability, even if, you know, this is going to be, you know, another Texas decade. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the the interesting animating questions is to what extent will politics affect choices? You, When one thinks of Texas, one thinks about prag- pragmatic, fiscally oriented leaders, theoretically, but a great example of where that's not true is on Medicaid expansion, where you've seen other Republican states choose to expand um and offer Obamacare, um, i.e. Medicaid, um, in their states. And it actually, in Texas's instance, would save the state money, but they're refusing to do th- to do so, I think, for political reasons. And so um, absolutely, there are huge issues with the safety net. Um, I mean, both California and Texas are very difficult places to be poor for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, it is true that Texas has a lower cost of living, and so there's poten- it's potentially easier to rise. But um, yeah, I, I think the storm is another great example of where the leaders, you know, it, had a real opportunity in the last legislative session to make structural re- reforms that would make the state safer to future extreme weather events and very little, if anything, change. So um, the need to really focus on things that affect the daily lives of Texans rather than messaging and um, and um, it, rather than messaging to their bases, I think will will be key for the for the state's vitality. <laughs> 
And just to add, it seems like there's a lot of um, anxiety here in Texas about the future of the oil and gas industry, right? As we move towards yeah. a new economy that isn't based on oil and gas, I wonder, um, and I certainly know that my students wonder about, uh, you know, where the future lies with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, one last topic as we as we prepare to close, you know, what about... Um, you know, kind of cent- the role of the role of race in 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 the the futures and and changes in both states. You know, I I am really struck, and I think a lot of people are, to know that you know California became a so called majority minority state. I know there's a lot of problems with that term, but but using it for now as a rubric in two thousand in two thousand and Texas followed in two thousand five, and you know Texas is the only state in the former in the in the in the South. To have a majority minority population, only forty uh, percent now of Texans are non-Hispanic whites, and yet, of course, um, the power structures in Texas, you know, still kind of, in some ways, you know, really reflect uh, uh, that of a, of a of a kind of previous time. And I and I'm just curious about, you know, where where you all see that future. Um, you know, Sergio, is this a topic that that you could that you could elaborate on? Yeah. Uh... I think it's going to play an important factor, not only electorally. I think uh, we might see uh, in certain communities um, much more animus and sort of um, uh, anti-Latino, anti-immigrant uh, uh, sentiments. Those, those are we can see those everywhere. And Texas is a big state, and while there are many Latinos that have been in Texas historically, even uh, before uh, the United States was the United States, and, it, and, and in fact, the border crossed them, there are areas where uh, we see uh, less concentration of Latinos, and those are probably areas where that we're going to see more and more, and we'll see shifts then in attitudes. Now, does that mean, does that immediately transfer to gains or losses for anyone's uh, race? And I don't think that's necessarily the case, and I go back to the example of the Cruz versus um, Beto Rourke, where Beto was clearly favored by uh, Latinos. So it really goes back to the things that Latinos care about. I think we're going to see uh, many adjustments in terms of um, sentiment toward Latinos and immigrants, but how those are translating to uh, electoral politics uh, is yet to see. Yep. Okay, one final question, and this is going to be around Robin, and this has been such a great discussion. Um, um, Sorry I jumped over a bunch of topics, but there's been so much ground to cover. Um, Any final thoughts on the question, Californians, do they help or hurt Texas? Ken? Yeah, I would say, uh, in general, they're a net positive for for Texas. They bring uh, they bring added wealth to the state, um, creativity, dynamism, fresh perspectives. Uh, I also think it's it's important to note that um, newcomers can change a place in some respects. So Californians will change Texas in, in important ways, uh, but uh, a place changes newcomers uh, as well. That as people uh, migrate from California and other places into Texas, they're going to absorb and adopt a lot of the cultural um, and philosophical attitudes of, of Texas. That's just a natural thing in cultural psychology. And so I, I, if I were a, uh, a resident of Texas, I would not be overly concerned about this. I would welcome Californians and, play, and pr- people from other places as well. Alexandra? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, um, you know, both states, both California and Texas have been fueled throughout their histories by immigration uh, at large. And I think this is one strand of immigration that will be very positive for Texas. I think Ken hints at a very interesting question, which is there's so much concern about uh, tech among um, Republican Texans about these Californians turning Texas blue. Um, It's not obvious to me that that's where they're going to take the state. I think as Ken alluded to, they, they may change when they come to Texas, or it's entirely possible that they're leaving California because they are rejecting the Democratic Party and Democratic policies. And so the, the Californians who are leaving and coming to Texas are actually going to look a lot more like the average Texan voter. Um, and so I think it's going to be a fascinating thing to watch yeah. about how Californians influence over Texas um, evolves. Um, but I think it's an absolutely a thing to be celebrated. 
Sergio? I definitely think this is positive. My whole family now uh, lives in Texas. And I'll say Texas has changed my family. I call Texas El Paso my second home. And I think Texas has changed me more than I can probably have changed uh, anyone else around me in Texas. Uh, it is. Uh, I agree completely that people don't necessarily move because of political reasons, but they move because of the life they're uh, trying to find. And if they're arriving at a new place, they're probably likely to absorb these, those new ways of living. And so it's not clear uh, where uh, politics might go one way or another. But I think overall, newcomers are always um, good. And that's, you know, coming from an immigrant. And Sergio, you grew up in El Paso, correct? I, um, I grew up in Mexico. And then I came as a young adult, but have lived there uh, most of my life. Well, now in New York, but that's where family is, yes. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Jennifer? I think it can only be positive. Um, I think that, again, you're just thinking about, you know, polarization and political sorting and people moving from place to place gives them familiarity with what is strange and, and othered otherwise. Yeah. Um, and having that firsthand experience um, builds bridges, right? And so, you know, it might be, you know, we've sort of framed this conversation as if, you know, it's either the red advantage or the blue advantage or either the Texas advantage or the California advantage. And, you know, sort of thinking about bridging and, and what we can accomplish together if, um, you know, it's sort of red and blue and purple all over. Finally, Ben. I think it's a good thing with a caveat and uh, the migration of Californians has been treated as a political issue, which I don't think it is um, as Alexandra and Ken were noting uh I don't think it's going to radically change the politics of the state. Um, an exit poll in 2018, which with the caveat, it's an exit poll, but found that O'Rourke was the preferred candidate of native Texans and Cruz won non-native Texans by a large enough, um, yeah. a large enough amount to win the race. Um, obviously non-native Texans includes far more than Californians. Um, but the caveat uh, that I was mentioning earlier is that there are policy challenges brought by Californians. Um, there's educational disparities. The wealth that Californians are generating doesn't necessarily rise all boats. I think that uh, it would behoove state leaders to treat this less as sort of a culture war issue and more as a policy one. Uh, this has been a tremendously enjoyable conversation for me, the chance to interview three political scientists who are who live in California, Texas, and New York, but is from Texas. And then two journalists who work in Texas now, but have lived in California, uh, as I have, uh, has just been incredibly fun. Thanks so much, all of you, Ben, Sergio, Jennifer, uh, Ken, and Alexandra, for your insights and for your time. Really, really appreciate this. Thank you for joining us for this Texas Tribune panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you.